record. All right, so perfect. Good afternoon, uh, Patrick Lisson, Patrick. Hi. <laughs> My name is Claudio. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., and this is Christian from Santiago, Chile, uh, from the Studios of Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Patrick Lisson accepted our invitation to the show. Uh, Patrick, welcome to the show again. Thank you. Appreciate Part it. Two. So uh, first of all, how, how are you doing the pandemic? How's your wife doing? And uh... Well, as I uh, told you a few months ago, yeah, Charmaine has had some health problems. She's, yeah. de she's dealing with them. Yeah. Um, it's a form of di di diverticulitis. So it's, you know, she just has to be on a very strict diet. Perfect. Man. Yeah. But she's what, what about you? What, what about you? How are you doing, man? Managing the pandemic, I'm, you're trying to go out. I'm, I'm going to be like the one horse Shea, you know, I'm just going to keep going on just fine, and then one day I'll just drop. <laughs> All right, that's, that's good, man. Yeah, thanks, sir. I was telling Christian that here in the United States, you know, there's vaccine for everybody. Some people choose not to take it, and people like myself decided, you know, a long time ago they need that's the way to go. And people believe on it, some the people believe it, but hopefully, we'll get out of this mess. and yeah, you, hopefully. You know, you can you can play with your trio, and then I can see shows, and, and yeah. people can come back to a, a normal life. Um, so, so feel free, Christian, to start with the, the some question, and then we we we'll kind of piggyback, we we'll go back and forth. So. Thank you, Claudia. Hello, um, Mr. Patrick Lisson. What an honor! Greetings from Santiago, Chile. Uh, greetings from a teacher. I, I you don't have to know this, but I teach English. I've been doing that since the late nineties. And oh. I, I started to become an English teacher, but then I went to work on radio. <laughs> Life okay. has strange ways. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I understand that. Well, thank you for the time. Uh, I, was, I, I was sad that the last time you met with Claudio, I couldn't not participate, but everything comes in time. So yeah. good things come to those who wait, they say, yeah. <laughs> don't they? Yeah. So, um, well, um, thank you for being with us. I've been a big fan of your music for many years. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I was going to mention Rainbow Delta that you can see at my back uh, oh, in my record you know, display. It's just reissued. I want to show you something. Oh, 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 oh. I was wait wow! I've been waiting for that one. Yeah, the new CD of Rainbow Delta. Oh, right. what? it's just out. It's on fantastic. Yes, yeah. six records. And yeah, you, I, if you just uh, go on the internet and type in Patrick Cleason Rainbow Delta. Um, BSX will probably come up. Otherwise, just go to BSX Records, Patrick, please. Fantastic. Congrats. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say that that was my first encounter with you, with your music. And uh, I even used, uh, I must confess, Lagrange.5 is the title. Oh, I yeah. use it. Yeah, I used it many times for my radio shows and some uh, electronic oh, sure. background music for my shows. And uh, I, I, I read once that it has some connection with some... Uh, mathematical formulas, it almost uh, is linked with some scientific background. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. I, I read a book um, called The High Frontier. This came out in the 70s and it was by a guy who was at one time very high up in NASA. He was a PhD in physics. And what he proposed in, in his book were artificial planets and where they would be parked were at Lagrange points. So Lagrange points are where the, the degree of, of gravity pull from different adjacent uh, bodies is such that the, the artificial planet is held in a specific place in a stable manner. So you can have uh, what he proposed were sort of disc shaped uh, one mile in diameter um, foundations and a big dome above that. So there would be 10 million people living in one of these artificial planets. I thought that was tremendously hopeful and it hasn't, it hasn't turned out to be quite as hopeful as, as we thought because he thought by this time we would have several artificial planets going, but we don't. Yeah. Interesting. Now, I, there's another work that I admire you for that is uh, Lenny White's Venetian Summer. I love uh, it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and we were, I mean, fans were uh, lucky that Wounded Bear Records uh, rescued from, from, from oblivion. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you recall any particular aspects of the production or your contribution to the overall oh, yeah. sound of, of that sure. one? Sure. Well, I don't know if Lenny credited me or not, but I was the producer. <laughs> 
And so it was my, and we recorded it at a different firm, my studio. Yeah. So it was up to me to get, put everything together. So I contacted, um, uh, well, Lenny, Lenny contacted s s some of the players and then I contacted uh, Tower of Power to do the, the horn tracks. Yeah. And, and uh, it, was, it was a marvelous, I mean, the people on that album, man, those, those are yeah. some heavyweight people. Viola, yeah. 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 And they were all a delight to work with. Those people were just great. Yeah. And Lenny, too. I have to tell you a funny little story about at that time, I, I was married to uh, Patricia Barham, it was her name. And her mother was staying with us. At, at, in, at the studio, my apartment was above the studio. So she was staying with us. She did not approve of me. She thought I looked like Charlie Manson, which I sort of did at that point. I had a beard and long hair. And, uh, and she just in general, you know, wished her daughter were with somebody a little straighter. But then this one day, Lenny came up. Now, Lenny would be like this kind of person's worst nightmare. I mean, here's this, this extremely hip black man with a wearing of a big cowboy hat and giving off New Yorker vibes, right? So he and I started to work on a tune together on my, I had a Fender Rhodes up in the, in the living room in the apartment. And at a certain point, I looked over at this woman, my mother-in-law, who just never approved of me and never liked me. And she was just barely awake and she was rocking back and forth to the music we were making and she had this huge smile on her face. <laughs> After that, she went back to hating me, but for, for a minute, she, she, she really got it. She... <laughs> That's a good story, man. And weren't there any further contributions with Lenny, Lenny White? After that one, after the Venetian Summer? No? Well, uh, Lenny, you know, Lenny and I played in, in this new trio in New York um, about a year and a half ago, just before the pandemic. pandemic. And, and I want to do, I'm, I'm doing two trio albums. The first one is with um, uh, Michael Shreve and mm -hmm. the second one is with Lenny White. And, and then I, I've used Sam uh, for, on the first album and I'm using Lenny Pickett on the second album. Lenny Pickett is the musical director for Saturday Night Live. And I've known Lenny since he was about 15 years old. Look at that. Well, Were you neighbors or something? No, uh, he came over because of Tower and Power. He was playing with Tower Power and, we, and I would periodically have Tower come over to do sessions. But what Lenny and, and his wife told me later was that I, they said uh, that I was the first guy they ever saw making music and living a good life. Uh, that's an exception, huh? And yeah, and so they said that I was... A, an inspiration to them. Now, if that's so, I'm very pleased because, of course, Lenny, Lenny is sort of famous. He's like an incredible career, and his wife—they're just they're wonderful people. She just got a PhD in in physics, although she's in her 60s. Well, now that you just mentioned it, I was going to to take that topic. Uh, I was going to ask you about Michael Schriever uh, and the Bedroom Window soundtrack that I always always uh, also like very much, and I have played in my radio shows. Uh, I read about an unreleased album somewhere, and you just mentioned that you have a project about something, maybe a new album with him. Well, a new album with, with Lenny and, and uh, Sam Morrison. It's a trio album. We had started it, we, we started it by recording live in Seattle. We had a professional engineer who came to the club and did a great job of recording it. But then I just felt myself that the music wasn't ready, you know, that we really hadn't taken it where it needs to go. And... Um, so I, I, I started over at a certain point. And then I've also gotten a little bit diverted because I'm, I'm just in the process of completing a quadraphonic album. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. This, this is the, um, Suzanne Chiani came out with a quadraphonic album about uh, four years ago. Four years ago, yeah. And this is with the same producer. So I, when I played Moogfest, I met the guy and he said, you know, I really want to work with you. I thought great, but he's incredible. I mean, he's, his name is Cameron V. And he's, he's an amazingly smart guy, very musical, but also very heavy, heavy into audio engineering. Well, do you, Patrick, do you work with, uh, I think, uh, one of the early members of 
you know, power, tower power was uh, Hoover Tubbs. You know him or who? Hoover, T U B B S. No, probably without. In the seventies, probably you don't know. He was he was from Oakland, California as well. No, and then okay. he ended up moving. He's in Europe now, but he okay. was one of the early singers of the. But what was he? What does he play? Uh, he he was a singer, the main singer of oh, that word of power, and in oh in this, okay yeah right right yeah he he I thought you may remember and uh, but go go ahead Christian I just wanna yeah I, I meant to ask you uh, Mr Gleason uh, you were planning a trio or an album with Mike uh, Shreve included I didn't get yeah. it but yeah yeah Michael Michael Shreve and Sam Morrison Sam Morrison okay. was with Miles in the 80s and um, what wonderful wonderful reed player very very fluid and um, we'll come out with that album but it'll probably be I'm going to say another year because we, first we, I've got to get the album the, the quadraphonic album out which we're, we're going to release it in August and then I hope to tour that album that's a solo album so I'll probably do that first but now we were living in the age of uh, uh, 5.1 and all those remi remixes and remastering, uh, remasterings. Uh, I wonder if that uh, quadraphonic format is easy accessible to, to people like these days. Well, um, that's an interesting point. I want to tell you about that. It's very interesting. So this guy, Cameron V, the guy I'm talking about, he was actually, I think... Sony, I think he was the first um, uh, C-suite tech guy at Sony, which meant that he, and, and, uh, he, he came to Sony when he was like in his early 20s. And he left in his late 20s by that time having accumulated, a, I'll just say a considerable amount of money. Hmm. You're in the C-suite at Sony, you're gonna be, do well. And he, and he realized that this was not what he wanted to do. What he wanted to do was music technology where he decided what the technology was. He's come out with this uh, particular kind of new waveform, which is what they used also on Suzanne's album, which is, um, he calls it Quark, Q-U-A-R-K, which is kind of a joke. It's an yeah. artificial element. Um, but what the, what the Quark, wave file does it senses what the output is it's smart and if it's playing into a stereo environment it plays the album in full and stereo and if it's if it senses a quadraphonic environment it sends four outputs four separate outputs so it's kind of a magical it's almost like a magic trick and you can you can put these files up on spotify so people can go to Spotify and pull off an album which they can listen to in stereo or listen to in quad. Uh, SACD is a, is a good format, but of course you can't play it in, in stereo. What is, SACD will only play in, in quadraphonic. This one will play either way. And then the other thing the same guy is doing, he set up a, a, a plant in the, the Netherlands which is now making, they're just starting to, I don't think they've actually come to, to assembly line process, but he's, in fact, he's there this week. And what they're going to have is a, a plant that will produce quadraphonic disc cutters for, guess how much money? Very little. A thousand dollars. Oh, wow. A thousand dollars. So, and then after you've cut the album, you can play the album on the same cutter. So it's, it's, a, it's a revolutionary new device. And I think between the, the general new interest in, in, in certain kinds of uh, enveloping environments in, in music and, and the technical achievements, I think, I think we're coming to a new age of quadraphonics. I mean, basically, when you go to a theater, you're you're hearing a 12 or a 14 channel system. So why do you want to hear a two channel system when you go home? Why why do you think uh, that it didn't work out in, back in those days, like in the 70s, mid 70s? Because Sony press they, sure. they came out with a big huge catalog. Yeah. Uh, 
if I can find it easily. Let me just gentle wait for a second here. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the new quadraphonic version of the, the album wow. that Herbie and the guys we all made together in the early 70s. It sounds incredible. The, the, the Sony engineer that took over making the stereo files quadraphonic really took it to heart and uh, he did a wonderful job. So this is now out in quad. Not, you have to order it from England, unfortunately. It takes about six weeks, but anyway. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Now, if, uh, I wanted to ask you also um, about the best memories you have uh, from a different fur. I know that you uh, established that recording studio, then you sold it. But uh, you you have some, 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 sometimes sorry said that you were like a group of helping or helpful hippies of some sort. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Very relaxed. It was a commune. Yeah. It was a commune. So John Vieira, John was a hip, you know a hippie electrical engineer. Uh, he quit his straight job and bought a Moog synthesizer, but he didn't know anything about music. So I came along and I said, let's hook up the two of us. I'll put in some money to make the, the mold bigger. And then we need to find a place where we can have a little studio. So that's how different fur came to be. You know, I'm, <laughs> what, what happened to that studio eventually is just crazy. I mean, everybody recorded it at that little studio. I mean, we had Stevie Wonder. <laughs> I mean, everybody was there. Um, and particularly from, from uh, black music. And, and also disco, we had Sylvester and all those guys. We had both the, we had the several gay um, men's labels. And then we also had both lesbian labels recorded at different tour. It was, I mean, it was just a wonderful experience because we really weren't business people. We were people that loved music. We needed a studio to make our own music. And then because that was kind of expensive, we rented the studio out, but, but then it became, I don't know, kind of a, a society and, and I, I found um, my studio manager is now sadly gone, but she, but she, Susan, Susan Skaggs was her name. She was just an amazing woman and she loved musicians. She was so, she was filled with empathy. So when, when a, a musician came to different fur, they didn't feel as if they were in a commercial establishment. They felt that they were among friends. And I think that's why the studio had this incredible success because people felt comfortable there. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, feel free to elaborate. I, I know the story, but probably Christian doesn't know that when you end up selling, remember that many real estate uh, developers in San Francisco ask you for, and then you end up selling to the lady and she couldn't help the matter. Remember the story yeah. was like, she say, you know, if whoever want to sell the studio, please. Yeah. You know, they try to work something out. And, Yeah. Feel free to elaborate on the story. It's a, it's a very good story. Yeah. But the, 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 when I finally sold the studio, I sold it to my studio manager yep. and my head engineer. And I sold it to them for a little under a million dollars. And they, they had no money down. And my business attorney said, Pat, don't do this. I mean, you're the reason people come to different fur. Well, ha, ha, ha. No, I left and nobody even noticed. <laughs> because Susan Skaggs was so good. And then I had another guy who came in who became the resident synthesist, uh, Pete Scaturo, who is now a senior manager at Sony. But he, he came in and, and um, I lent him the money to buy a small Synclavier. He went ahead and did sessions for people. People didn't even know I was gone. And they, and they paid me back. It took them 10 years. They, they paid me back, I think it was $880,000. Wow. Nothing point. down, never missed a payment. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Interesting. Now, um, I was going to, to remind you, you, you've mentioned the respect factor in adapting classical music to electronic. Maybe this is too old for you, but uh, what was the reaction to your adaptations of Vivaldi, uh, you know, Holst? I think that the Holst album was a little bit of an issue regarding the whole estate back in those yeah, days? Imogen, his daughter, hated it. Um, well, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's two stories I'd like to tell you, if I could, about th this. The first, of course, was the one you mentioned. Um, so at a certain point, I decided I was going to do this classical album, and I 
went ahead and went in the studio at night and, and did the first movement of Pulse Planets. So I sent it to RCA. I don't even know why I sent it to RCA, but I just sent it to, to one uh, company. They wrote me back very quickly, I think in about two weeks, and they said, you know, we love the album. Unfortunately, we've already signed another artist, Iseo Tomito, to do the same piece of, of music. So then I, okay. So then I finally, there was a woman who was the head of class, Mercury Classics at, at Mercury Records. And she was a, a kind of a, a person who liked to stir things up a little bit. And she wanted to change what was going on in music. So I thought, oh, this will be a great company to go to. So I sent it to her and, and they, they took it. But then they found out that Imogen Holst would not allow the music to be played. She felt it was a desecration of her father's symphonic poem. But the, and then the Mercury lawyer said, <coughs> excuse me, I said, wait a minute, you know, uh, you've already issued a license to, to, to meet it. And RCA said, no, we haven't. Yes, you have. And so they confirmed the fact that the Canadian branch of the company, without notifying Imogen Holst, had gone ahead and approved Tomita's releasing it, at which point Mercury said, okay, you can tell us we can't release it as well, but then we're going to file suit against you because you've already allowed another artist to do the same thing. So with that, we were able to do it. So that's one of the stories I wanted to tell you. The other one is briefer. I have to say, look, I'm looking back on my career, which I'm doing right now, I'm part of this release um, of this new quad album. It has a couple of CDs in it, which sort of span from my first record with Herbie up to the present and about two hours of music. So I'm listening to this music and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, really, uh, even though the the, the, my version of The Planets was nominated for uh, a Best Classical Engineering Grammy. Um, even though um, it, it was favorably received, in retrospect, I'm not that crazy about what I did. I, because I think I'm, I really missed a bet. And, and, you know, look, look, listening to the to the whole planets, honestly, it's not the greatest music in the world. It's big, it's flashy, it it's it's not really great concert music. What it is, if you listen to the, some of the umpa rhythms, it's just incredibly good circus music. And what I should have done, I think, is played with that idea and made it, you know, a sort of a Faustian uh, 30s German uh, decadent nightclub-like version of circus music. I didn't do that, it's too straight. Um, I, I think, yeah, I just, I, I missed a bit. This makes me jump to another question I have at the end of my list, uh, maybe fits this moment. What is something that you still feel you haven't accomplished in the electronic music scene that you feel you should work on or complete someday? Maybe another classical piece of music, you know? No, 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 never, no. No, never any music now except my own. Um, I kind of feel, I mean, I may feel differently in a year, but I, I kind of feel the music on this quad album is so much stronger than anything I've ever done before, but I've been working to get there for the last maybe close to 10 years. Um, and I mean, maybe, in, maybe, maybe in another six months, actually, I hope in another six months, I'll feel like, okay, there's some new further direction to go in, but I'm very pleased with this music because it, <clears throat> it really is unashamed about reaching out and grabbing certain features of uh, American minimalism, Steve Reich, Terry Riley, and chiefly. Um, and, but it also addresses everything I learned when I was with Herbie and, and 
working as a as a composer and arranger for lots of jazz musicians. So it's, it really is contemporary jazz. And also it really is contemporary electronic dance music because I've, 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 what I've done is I've, I've inserted a lot of very interesting rhythms that cross each other. So it's got the boom, 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 but it's also got So it's got this steady beat, but it's also got all kinds of jazzy beats going on. And then the, some of the music is rather abstract. It, it's, it doesn't sound like Stockhausen, but it's on the way there. Are you a good dancer yourself? Am I might dance. Do you, do, you, do you dance every now and then? I, I <laughs> my, my wife and I used in this, in about, let's see, 10 years ago, for about a decade, we went to, uh, when we go to Paris, we go, go to the dance clubs. And the funny thing is, because of my age, there'd be this long line of kids waiting to get into the dance club, and they'd see me, oh, here's this old white guy with this beautiful middle-aged black woman. We need them in the mix. So they just, they would just <laughs> gesture us past all the kids and we'd march to the head of the line. All right. Yeah, that was fun. We well, haven't done that recently, but you know, there's a lot of the clubs in, in uh, Paris have had some problems too. Like everywhere else, yeah. Now I was, I was going to ask you, uh, did you, and if so, how much influence did you, did you have to get from the German scene, like, uh, you know, Klaus Schulz, The Tangerine Dream, and sure. even, even from the US, Wendy Carlos, Glass, Riley, and those people, were you influenced by any of them in any way? Well, of course, Wendy is, is an inspiration. But as I, as I implied a few minutes ago, I really think, in retrospect, only one musician ever really nailed it for translating classics to synthesizers, and that was Wendy. I mean, she wrote wonderful liner notes complimenting me on what I'd accomplished. But the fact was that, in actuality, uh, if Tamita and I were probably the two guys that came close, and I don't think we got there. You know, I think I think Wendy's work remains uh, at a pinnacle. Um, what was the other question you were going to ask me? I'm sorry. No, I know. Uh, if uh, if you ever had any influences in your own creations oh, oh, by the music you... they generated. Well, there, yeah, I, I, I did. In fact, um, I engineered Michael Honig's Journey from the. Uh, Northern Wasteland. Oh, I love the one. Yeah. Good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, wonderful. And uh, and and then uh, who was the guy from Tangerine Dream? I can't think of his name. Neat guy. Uh, we were going to do an album together, and uh, and that that didn't happen because our schedules got. We, he was in in Germany, and I was in California, and just got. We couldn't do it at that time, so that didn't happen. But I, I love I love Tangerine Dreams music. Uh, I, now that you mentioned him, I, I I must say this: I'm a big fan of uh, Michael Koenig's score to I Madman, which is a movie I really like a lot. And it never came out the soundtrack score uh, for I Madman, and that's one of his unreleased works. So yeah. But these days they are releasing so many soundtracks from the 80s and 70s that it's really amazing. Yeah. In these yeah. vi re color vinyl records and all that is crazy. No. Yeah. The records outsold CDs last year. Yeah, yeah, they did. Now, if if we remain in the in the companion, I mean, in the colleagues in the community, I'm a big fan also of other people like Larry Fast, Synergy. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had the chance to hear some works by Beaver and Kraus. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Philip Glass came. Yeah. 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 Ah, they did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, look at that. Well, Philip Glass was luckily in Chile a few years ago. And uh, I'm also a big fan of Steve Roach, Susan Tiani that you mentioned. Have you yeah. ever had any interaction, like done any music with them, projects or? With I don't know? Uh, Suzanne or? or, or, or yeah, Larry Fast. Oh, no, Larry Fast. I was briefly on, on his uh, the same label with Larry. Uh, Rainbow Delta was on. Yes, yeah. he was on. I, I never met Larry. Um, and the other was when uh, Philip Glass, Beaver and Cross. Cross, you said something about them. Well, I engineered a couple of albums for Beaver and Cross. Um, they were they were done at different firm. 
Uh, there is one called, sorry, the new electronic guy. No, the, 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 the guy to yeah. new electronic music. That's fantastic. That's the one I, I got a hold of. Yeah, back in the that, 80s. That, that, that was done before uh, I hooked up with those guys. They had done that already. Okay. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the names of the albums that I worked on. I worked on two albums for them. And then uh -huh. we were together, not happily, unfortunately, but we were together, Bernie and I, on the, the score for Apocalypse Now. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was the head of the project, yeah. <laughs> according to, <clears throat> to Francis Coppola, although some of the other musicians had a problem with that, of course. And um, Bernie was one of them. So he wasn't too happy with the fact that I was now his boss because when we first got together, I was this guy with this little studio in the Mission District that was really inexpensive that they could go record since there. And, and, you know, Bernie was in effect, you know, in charge of, of the sessions that I was engineering. So the, the roles reversed and it was hard for Bernie. Um, so it, it, it didn't go as well as it could have, yeah. Do you have any particular recollections from your experience of working with Mr. Coppola back in those days? Like, oh, did, yeah. he, did he give you freedom? Was he all the time, up, you know, pushing you well, to do something? It was a combination of both. You know, uh, he would, he was very, and he was also very intuitive and very impulsive. I mean, uh, he was over listening to a cue I had done, I think one of the first cues, and he was just sitting there. And he said, you know, I want you to be in charge of this project, which was the first I'd ever heard of this. <laughs> and so then he wanted me, then he wanted me to, well, he, then he had a dinner and invited all the other synthesists. And then at the dinner, he introduced me to everybody else as if they didn't already know me, saying, this is basically the guy that's gonna be in charge of you. And some of the guys didn't like that very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Could you mention a couple of them? Uh, like, uh, not, not because of the, you know, the problem that they, they, there was, but uh, some people that may, maybe we have some, seen some records by. Oh, sure. Um, Let's see, um, who's the, the guy that used to be with uh, uh, Frank Zappa? Um, ah, Patrick Gohier? Hmm? No, Patrick Gohier? No. No. The, E.M. No. Underwood? No. Key, key, keyboard player that was with Francis, with, with uh, okay. Zappa was with him. Uh, and uh, Shirley Walker, who was the, the, the piano player for the Oakland Symphony, who was also interested in synthesis. She and Bernie worked together and also, also unfortunately, they didn't get along. So, <laughs> so uh, it, was, it, was, it was a complicated uh, session. I, I, I'm not that crazy about the score because I think it had the wrong composer. Francis had his dad compose the score. Carmen. Yeah, and Carmen is a wonderful musician. Uh, he was Toscanini's flute player back in the day. And um, so, you know, you gotta be pretty good to be Toscanini's flute player. And he had taken composition lessons from some illustrious uh, 20th century teachers. But, you know, composing is a weird thing in a way you don't really teach anybody to, to, to compose. What you do is you help them to unfold what it is they already have to contribute. And if they don't have, at the end of the day, that to contribute, it doesn't matter how much unfolding you do or how much you expose them to, it's not gonna be that great. I felt, to be very frank, I felt Carmine was a mediocre composer. And of course, you know, since it was, Francis' dad, you didn't say that. But, but then I got kind of caught in a way between Francis and Carmine and um, the guy who was the head of post-production because he hated Carmine's music. <laughs> and he called me up one day and he said, I want you to send that Dulong bridge cue over to me. I said, I already sent it to you. And he said, no, I want it on the 24 track. I said, well, wait a minute. You're in head of post-production, but I'm head of the music. So if you want something changed, tell me and I'll change it. But I don't want you to do the remix. 
So the guy said, well, you know, if, if, if that's the way it's going to be, the, the cue is not going to be in the movie. I said, fine. He said, well, look, at, can you at least get rid of that flute? And I said, well, Carmine had come in. We had finished the cue. Carmine came in, listened to it. Oh, we loved it and wanted to play his flute on it. So that's how the flute came to be there. He said, well, you got to get rid of it. So what I did was, since Carmine's a good musician, he can hear pitch probably faster than, better than non-musicians. So I made a white noise sort of dupe track that covered up the flute, but it had enough pitch left in it that Carmine could still hear it. So <laughs> Carmine listened to it and he felt the flute should be louder. I said, well, this is what they wanted and he just shrugged and it was okay. <laughs> yeah. But it was a complicated s score, socially speaking. I understand. Now, do, do you have any recollections, memories, nice memories of the guys with, of Devo, from Devo? Devo? Oh. Call them that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they were, they were, they were fun. They were, they were um, guys that Bruce Conner had yeah. discovered, the American painter and, and filmmaker. And Bruce said, well, you got to, the, the guys at, at Devo were dissatisfied. They'd been offered uh, a record contract from uh, Warner Brothers. And, um, and they were, they were, you know, they were young guys, they were arrogant and snotty and they, they didn't think any offer was good enough. So they came to me because Bruce had recommended me and said, you know, you, you, you make us some music that we can sell, uh, the, the, you know, where it's, it's going to be the way we want it. I said, well, well, we can try it out. I'll, I'll produce a couple of demos and we'll see what happens. So I did that. I gave it to the folks at Mercury and they said, yeah, well, we like this. And I said, well, how big will the advance be? They said, well, 25,000. I said, no, 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 no. I said, they've already got an offer for 125, which they've turned down. Sorry, let me just get rid of this. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. And um, so they said, well, we could go to 75. I said, you know, they've already turned down 125. Why, why, why do you think going to 75 is going to make a difference? Well, try it. So we recorded the pieces and of course, Mercury wouldn't come up and Warner Brothers was already at 125. So they went with Warners. And then as it turned out, um, they used the two pieces that I had recorded that those pieces were on the two tunes I produced are on the final album. And at first they didn't pay me for them. You know, the young rock and roll guys, you know, we can get away with this. So, and then my lawyer called their management company and then they, they sent me a check. It, it, um, doctor, uh, I keep calling you doctor, Patrick Gleason. Um, feel free to, and this is a good, a good topic also um, for the audience, may, may like the stuff, but uh, Remember when you start doing kind of well, and then MOOC uh, three came along. Yeah. Obviously, it was very expensive, and you asked your dad and yeah. to lend you the money was twenty grand at the time. So a yeah. lot of money. A lot of money. Yeah. So feel free to elaborate on, on what happened after that. Like, well, you know, he said he said I won't lend you the money. I said, okay. Then, I don't know if it was immediately or a day later, I think he talked with mom, they were very close. And he came back to me and he said, I won't lend you the money, but I will give you the money. Don't ever ask again. I said, great. So uh, that's what happened. And uh, at, at first when I went into music, my folks were just really upset with me. You know, they're Irish immigrants. They all, what, what do immigrant parents want? They want their kids to be doctors. Doctors, right, yeah. So I fooled them, I became doctors, but as my mother complained, not a real doctor, I'm a PhD, which she didn't consider to be a real doctor. <laughs> so anyway, that, that I don't, I can't remember where we were going with this, but. Um, yeah, and uh, he ended up lending you the money. And he, you ever, yeah. and you did work very well financially. You mentioned that, you know, I think at one, moment, one point early in your life, you were doing better than your dad, right? And yeah, my, my mother late in life, it was just oh, a few months before she died. She was in her 90s. And I'm sitting at the breakfast table with her. And she, when she would get nervous, she would always take her, her fork and kind of, I don't know if you can see it on 
line, but she would take a fork and kind of turn it a little bit like that, back and forth nervously. So she's got the fork as she's turning it. She said, um, um, your, your, your dad um, has told me um, that he thinks uh, you make more money than he does. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought, God, that's really a change, isn't it? Because at a certain point, I looked at my dad's, my dad always kept uh, a diary. And after he died, I looked back at his diary and in the early seventies, he had written, uh, Pat has broken his mother's heart. Oh, you know, because I was into drugs and into, into music instead of you know, being a responsible citizen. <laughs> so, so for them to come around and, and think it was okay. And even at the end for my mother to say that she, my dad thought I was more financially more successful than he was. I don't know if that was true, but I thought it was fun that she thought it might be true. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing also, I think it's important. At what point you quit? I don't know. It was, I remember correctly, it was uh, the story with uh, your piano teacher that you want to, you discover jazz and, and you say, no, 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 I want to learn jazz. I want to learn jazz. And she say, no, right. no, no, I'm, I'm teaching you classical music and you end up quitting music for like yeah. 15 years, yeah, right? Was, That's I was devastated about that. I mean, the, the, the situation was I had, you know, bad piano teachers. I mean, they were well-intentioned people, but they were not highly skilled or, or gifted. And yeah. so I took piano lessons from them for eight years and they were, uh, they were nuns, Catholic nuns at our grade school. And then when I went to high school, I took lessons from uh, a, a man who, I, the only interest he had in me was my $5 a week. <laughs> and so I had this kind of amazing meeting. I won't go into the details of it, but my, I had a hip cousin and she set up this meeting between me and this uh, uh, African-American, uh, musician, piano player, that, whose music I loved. He lived in Seattle. And um, and she's, Mary had set it up because she thought, okay, we got to get this kid over to doing the kind of music he wants to make. So she, the whole, the meeting was a setup. I mean, I, I thought they all, we'd all just run into one another, but Mary had planned it. So then she asked the guy, she said, you know, do you ever take students? And he was a, a big, elegant man looked a little bit like Oscar Peterson. And he, and he, he towered above me, he was like, you know, six foot three or something. He said, well, not usually, no. But why don't you fall by the pad and let's see what happens? I thought, fall by the pad and see what happens. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I run home, I tell my parents, this is a, you know, a reach for them. I mean, this, from their perspective, they were always slightly feeling that they felt a little bit sorry for the woman next door because her her son was a violinist in the Seattle Symphony. <laughs> like this was a mark of shame. So you can see that the idea of their son becoming a jazz musician was not highly uh, appealing. So they, they kind of waffled on it and they said, we're not qualified, but we're gonna ask your piano teacher. This was this man who took my $5 every week. And he said, oh, not until he has completed the fundamentals. Well, I'd been taking piano for nine years and I hadn't completed the fundamentals. And boy, we never complete the fundamentals, but, but you know, it just, it blew, and my parents said, no, that's it. Then, you know, you either don't have lessons at all or you have lessons with this man. I, I, I never want to see this guy again. So I didn't, I didn't make music for, gosh, 50, 14, 15, so 20, 20, almost, almost 15 years. Wow, wow. Well, you, you did well in your life anyway, so yeah. it, it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, all's well, it ends well. That's right, go ahead, Christian. <laughs> right. Um, now, uh, Patrick, Mr. Gleason, uh, why you. are you? Yeah, yeah. Patrick is good. Yeah. Okay. Or oh, Pat, uh, okay. your views. What are your views about technology in support of the artists and performers yesterday and today? You, you know, uh, how have things changed 
at the moment of creating, orchestrating, performing? Ah, yeah, the answer that, may be obvious, but I'd like to listen to hear it from you. That's a very interesting question. And I think that my fellow musicians, maybe me too, are going to have a hard time with the, the changes that are coming because when the synthesizer came in in the 60s, you know, that was very disruptive for many musicians. I mean, the guys in my own band didn't like what I was doing for months. Um, my, the first review for, with me on record was Herbie's Crossings and the reviewer from Downbeat didn't mention me until the last paragraph. And then he did, he said, and about that synthesizer player, the oh. less said, the better. <laughs> that was the review. See, so, so mu musicians have had a hard time accepting technology before. Um, and, and I can understand why. I mean, at the end of the day, technology at the end doesn't necessarily help musicians or, or, or financially, certainly. I mean, if, if you think that's true, look at your royalties on Spotify. You know, oh, I, I made a dollar and 42 cents last year. <laughs> so, and unless you're, you know, a, a platinum selling act, you, this technology has not been kind uh, to musicians. So I think they're going to have a terrible time with this next one because what I see coming, I, I've even delved into it a little bit, is uh, artificial intelligence composition and orchestration. I think it's coming faster than people imagine. I think what what in in ten years the experience of a let's just say someone doing television or what do we have at that point that's a half hour to an hour of music. I think that the way that's going to be made is you in some fashion or other write up what it is that you want, and then you get back what artificial intelligence gives you and then you tweak it. But I don't think, I don't think composition is going to be, I mean, you, you won't be able to compete with, with artificial intelligence. They can do it, it'll be done too quickly. So I think that's gonna be very hard on people. Uh, and I, I also think that people say, well, yeah, but uh, you know, we have live music and live performance. Well, that's going to continue to change. I mean, when people go to hear a Broadway musical now, half the music they hear is recorded. There's, there's an orchestra in the pit, but there's also a guy over there with Ableton Live feeding tracks into the live music. So it, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be, you know, I'd, I'd like to think of it being better. The technology will make lives better for musicians, but I, I don't think it will. Okay, now uh, maybe you can see the Plague Dogs soundtrack album. Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you remember those days? Uh, I never seen the movie because it, it would it never they never showed it in Chile. Well, so, yeah, but I, I like the music. You know, you know the reason they didn't sell it in Chile was it flopped. But it flopped for a very interesting reason. So, Martin Rosen was really the first Hollywood professional. Uh, director I'd ever worked with, at least of any consequence. And um, Martin was a very interesting guy. Uh, he's a friend of mine, 50 years later. In fact, we're going to be visiting them in, in uh, Marin County next month. Uh, but he, he had done this film before this um, that was this huge hit. And this, The Plague Dogs was written by the same guy. So Martin's, when Martin took on the, the, the film, he was presumably going to be making an animation of the book. The book has a happy ending. The little dogs escape from the animal laboratory and they're chased and pursued. But finally, they, they're able to get to someplace safe and be okay. Martin took a look at this and he said, no, the whole trajectory of the story, it's, 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 a, it's a protest book against uh, animal experimentation. 
and how horrible it is for the animals. The whole trajectory is not a happy ending. It's, this, this is how bad this can be. So in Martin's film, the little doggies at the end are being pursued and they run to the sea and they jump into the water and they swim out as the sun is setting to their special island. They're on their way to their special island. And one of the dogs says to the other, I can see it now, but you know that it's a mirage. There is no special island and that the dogs are going to die by drowning. It's very clear. <laughs> when, when I went to the, the uh, it wasn't the premiere, but one of the very early showings. And at the end of the film, the lights go up and there's, weren't, there weren't many people in the audience. And there's a mother and her son coming up the aisle. And the son is about eight or nine. And he's got his face buried in his mother's dress and he's sobbing. And she's saying, no, no, dear, it's, it's just a cartoon. Nobody really dies. <laughs> well, I, I think that what this kid found upsetting, the world found upsetting. So. Martin's second film didn't, didn't do, uh, Watership Down was the, the name of the first one, it was a huge hit, and uh, the second one flopped. But it was a good film, and now people are beginning to realize that. I've heard more favorable comments about it the last couple of years. Yeah. It was remember this, sorry, go I, ahead, please. I was just gonna say, it was a fun score to do. I did it with the Kronos Quartet. And, oh, wow. And, yeah, and I overdubbed. Uh, percussion and, and brass. Um, I, I really wanted a full orchestra, but there was no budget for that. And the Kronos were amazing. I mean, they had a big sound. And then what what I did with them was I wrote parts, not for four violins, uh, four string instruments, but for 12. So they would overdub three times, or overdub twice. They'd play their track and then overdub. So it was a big sound. And do you remember the, do you remember the song from uh, Watership Down? Who sang it? The beautiful song from Watership Down, uh, Garfunkel. I don't. I don't. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Now um, I can't. I cannot leave the miss the opportunity to ask you. I want to go back to the departure for the Northern Wasteland album by M Michael Hennig. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know this. I have to confess. I just. I. This is the first time I hear you were involved in the engineering aspect of the album. That's a, an album I really love. I think it's very much in the vein of Tangerine Dream, the Berlin School, so-called Berlin School, uh, sequ sequential type of music. Uh, any recollections, any memories about that? The sessions? Well, he had finished the album itself earlier, and then he came over to different fur uh, because he knew my interest in synthesizers. And we were going to do uh, a number of things that were going to make it more radio friendly. And I think what happened was as that process continued, Michael realized he was more interested in doing another album. So that's what we did instead, we did, did another album. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if that album was released because Warner Brothers, you know, they, they want big numbers. And I think what may seem like a hit if you're in our little niche of electronic music uh, is a failure in, uh, in commercial music today. Yeah. I don't think you can, you can't keep an al a, a group on your roster if they only sell 100,000 albums. You know, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to, to finish now with my, my questions, Patrick. I'd like to know what Mr. Patrick Leeson, Dr. Patrick Leeson does for fun and relax on a <laughs> normal day. What music are you listening to these days? How do you relax and get disconnected from all the rest? Yeah, well, uh, we only listen together as a family. I mean, there's just Charmaine and me. We, we only listen to music together, uh, really, um, while we're making dinner. And other than that, Charmaine has music going all day long in her office, which is right next door. But I don't because I can't do anything else and have music playing. I mean, if, if, I'm, if music is playing, that's where my attention is going to go. It's not entirely, it's not voluntary. It's just going to go there and nothing else is going to get done. So I, when I listen to music, I have to be working. I can't listen for fun, although I deeply enjoy it. Um, Something similar happens to me when music is playing. I cannot study, for example. I, I could never study with music. I, yeah. My attention went to music. 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for the time, Patrick. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure and so much fun to hear about all those, you know, anecdotes and uh, knowing that finally Pat uh, Rainbow Delta is out. How yes. can we get a hold of that? I, oh, I'd like it, to. It's on BSS, excuse me, oh, BSX okay. Records now. Um, they, they had me sign a bunch of autographed albums, so to tell me you want an autographed album. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations for your fantastic career and uh, enjoy your happy life, you and your wife, and the good music and the good, you know, the good vibes. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Patrick, for your time for part two. Maybe we'll do a part three in the future. And uh, so, uh, also, I, I got an email. I remember I, I, I told you that before or not, but I, I interviewed Suzanne. And uh, I was, I at the beginning, I didn't want to ask her directly. She can put me in touch with uh, Wendy Carlos. And uh, I got an email a couple of days ago that there might be a possibility. So I think uh, somebody, um, let's see. Somebody, I don't know who the person is writing or finished writing mm. an autobiography on Wendy Carlo, I think it's oh, done. Yeah. And, and of, you know, and of course, you know that, you know, Wendy Carlo has been, you know, out of the scene for many, many years. Yeah. You know, yeah. there is a person who kind of control everything that goes to her. So she, yeah. she may like to do interviews, she would like to do something, but. You know her partner. They say no, 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 no. We don't, you know, don't don't get involved with this. And unfortunately, so I, I, as I say, I got an email from San, and there is a possibility. I, w I will let you know if, 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 if something happens. You know, it's, uh, oh, well, that'd be great. That would be, uh, that would, and um, and also I got a hold of one of the early person that worked with Wendy at the time. You you were working with Wendy Carlos, Rachel. Uh, yeah, Rachel. She's in France. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a very 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 stubborn person, right? So I, if I have to knock twenty dollars, thirty or fifty, I, I will I, I will get my way. So <laughs> I, I get a I get a hold of somebody who knows her. So you know you know we'll we'll see we'll we'll see what happens. I will Good. keep people. Thank okay. you very much, Patrick. I uh, hope everything goes well with the telephonic and uh, with the, your trio, and hopefully we'll meet one day and. Uh, I have dinner or beer with Christian. That'd be great. And, uh, That'd be great. That would be great. I want you to hear this album in quad. You got to hear this quad album. We we will. Thank okay. you. Thanks again, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Bye. Thank you too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.